Our next speaker has a long experience uh, in early response on the ground, following disaster, crisis, and conflict. Please. Since 2010, she has given training and lectures all over the world on the topic of first aid to cultural heritage in crisis and conflict. So please sit down and please give a very warm welcome to senior program leader at ICROM, Aparna Tandon. Welcome up. Greetings to all. It has been an excellent con conference and I thank the Swedish National Heritage Board and all the organizers, especially the Swed uh, Baltic Nordic uh, ministers and their council for organizing this conference and inviting ICROM to present some of our experience as an intergovernmental organization. You heard about UNESCO and UNESCO's instruments at length what UNESCO does uh, in the, uh, to protect cultural heritage in emergencies. ICROM is a technical arm of UNESCO. It's an uh, intergovernmental organization that came into being after the Second World War when it was uh, deemed necessary to have an intergovernmental organization, a study center where good practices for restoration, post-crisis recovery can come together and uh, lead for post-war recovery after the Second World War. So from that history, uh, the programs at ECROM have evolved. And I'm going to talk about one such program, which is looking at preparing for the unforeseen or protecting heritage in the event of complex emergencies or immediately after mega disasters or armed conflicts. This presentation will include, uh, as I said, a brief introduction of ICROM's first aid and resilience for cultural heritage in times of crisis program, which is its flagship capacity development initiative uh, let's say, uh, founded in 2020, just when the world was uh, plunged into the COVID pandemic. I will also present some key considerations for managing catastrophic risks for heritage. And then uh, I will give a brief introduction to ICROM's First Aid to Cultural Heritage a framework for coordinated action during and after complex emergencies. We've been hearing about conflicts, disasters. We've been hearing about alternative futures. But one thing, one word which has been missing is complexity. Our lives, livelihoods, and cultures are threatened because we are living in a volatile, uncertain, ambiguous, and complex world where disasters, conflicts, risks are overlapping and drivers like climate change are increasing this risk. That's why in 2020, first aid and resilience for cultural heritage in times of crisis uh, was conceived to develop capacities at the interface of disasters, conflicts, and the climate crisis. The programmatic pillars to protect heritage that guide our action are on the screen, which are mainly prevention and risk reduction, forecasting and preparedness, emergency response, recovery and resilience, as well as interagency coordination and cross-sectorial knowledge exchange. So we offer international and regional FAR courses, on-demand national and regional courses, multi-hazard disaster risk management plans for diverse types of heritage, technical advice during a complex emergency, and multi-actor national and regional level simulations. And in Estonia, actually, the first national tabletop exercise was led by one of the FAR trainees. So what is FAR? 
FAR is a network of historians, ecologists, engineers, civil protection professionals, documentation specialists, curators, conservation architects, community leaders, and it spans 122 countries, and it is built on 10 years of ECROM training called First Aid to Cultural Heritage in Times of Crisis. Uh, from this training, we have developed a network of more than 2,000 plus cultural first aiders and it spans 122 countries. Now, coming to the aspect of complexity, we have been focusing on war, but there are also situations where in countries that are suffering from war, there have been unprecedented disasters such as what was faced by Turkey and Syria in 2023, where, uh, 2023 when there was a complete decimation. Buildings were completely destroyed and cultures, people were uprooted, several died, millions, uh, thousands and thousands of deaths. And we have been also speaking about armed conflicts such as uh, Ukraine, where we have not been talking so much about the simultaneous risk of fire, flooding, because Ukraine is also one of those countries that is suffering from the impacts of climate change. So I would like to present some key considerations, some key challenges, key problems, because one of the previous speakers said we should define the problem first. And I think this is where we should, you know, try to focus our attention on. What is the world in which we are operating? Insufficient and scattered data on damage and loss of heritage, as well as inventories. Even today, even today, the inventories in many of our countries are not in ready-to-share format with emergency responders. I'm not talking between us. Across sectors, there is a difficulty. Even countries like Italy, where civil protection sometimes, there is a heritage embedded in the civil protection law, they have difficulty in finding the right coordinates for buildings, and they have accidentally demolished churches because they did not know that the churches existed in the, in the roots. So it's not there. Heritage is not included in sufficiently in national security and disaster policies and programs that has already been highlighted. Disaster and conflict risk assessments for heritage are not coordinated with wider city, town or village level. And when I say disaster and conflict risk assessment, let's all remember that conflicts and disasters are larger societal disruptions these do not originate from heritage. So making heritage the center of conflict or disaster is not the right way to work or to start with. We need to think about the larger conflict, its root causes, and then understand how heritage drives or interacts with those root causes or proximate causes. Similarly, lack of budgets and field presence in the immediate aftermath. And this stems because heritage is not included in the national security and disaster policies and programs. So the Minister for Culture of Sweden has to be congratulated if she has already included, if they have, Sweden has already included culture in the vital infrastructure. So maybe budgets will follow, hopefully. Lack of, there is also, we have anecdotal, uh, you know, as a sector, we are very happy, we, are very, we feel very confident when we tell these stories, we are moved to tears when we hear about the power of culture. In this room, we are talking to the converted. But to the outside world, we have not provided scientifically robust data, evidence on how heritage contributes to disaster risk reduction. You have Sami people here in Sweden who have uh, early warning systems, they have ways of managing resources. How much of that knowledge has been put into the national disaster risk management policy? Similarly, 
how heritage contributes to peace building. By just rebuilding a church, am I building peace? Who has evaluated that work? Who has monitored that work? There is low accountability in our sector due to lack of standardization and benchmarking of practices and practical skills for working in hazardous conditions need to be upgraded. I love it when policymakers sit in a room and say, yes, we will recover the heritage of Ukraine. Well, the heritage of Ukraine today by the ministry, if we go by the ministry data, more than 1,000 buildings have been damaged or heritage sites have been damaged. By UNESCO standards, more than 400 have been damaged or they have reached the 400 mark, which UNESCO has verified. This is down and dirty work. People on the ground, brick by brick, will have to salvage, will have to secure, Cultural bearers, artists, artisans who have been displaced will have to be brought back, rehabilitated, their knowledge documented. This is a huge work, a huge undertaking, unfortunately, underfinanced, under-highlighted, not highlighted enough, and local communities that are the power, that hold the power, that could be the engines for recovery or resilience are excluded from heritage risk management. They are remembered in the last instance, but they are not part of our preparedness plans. We do not consider them when heritage institutions develop their preparedness plans. So in response to all this, ICROM in 2010 and after uh, a long period of field testing, developed this framework for action, which is not a method, but it's just an open framework which encourages interagency coordination and participation of local communities. It has been translated, the guidelines have been translated in uh, more than 16 languages, and it's free to download, and it has also formed the basis of certain ISO standards. Now, what is cultural first aid? And what do we mean by this? The idea of first aid is very simple. It is not a jump to recovery. It is that first step that you will take, which uh, will help promote recovery, reduce the risk, contain damage, and enhance coping and adaptive capacities of the heritage sector, but for the people. Because here, the focus is very much on the people. So unfortunately, it may not be your Monet painting in the National Museum, but it could be a church somewhere which is vital to a community's uh, uh, resilience or recovery that may be prioritized. So it's a very different lens for looking at heritage protection. And if we try, and this framework mimics humanitarian response and the disaster risk reduction uh, international framework, that's why the first aid is typically planned during emergency preparedness phase and kicks in during emergency response and early recovery. So it goes all the way up to early recovery. And early recovery is a phase in humanitarian uh, response. Why mimic humanitarian response? Well, first of all, to make sure that culture is an instrument for recovery and peace building. Secondly, as I already highlighted, we, we also need an ethical framework when we are working in disasters and conflicts because the very concept of heritage is contentious. It, is, uh, it can drive wedges, it can also bring people together, and it also, we have to go beyond national discourses of heritage when we are trying to work in crises. So our cultural first aid has to be people-centered, it has to be context-specific, it has to be inclusive, and should have respect for diversity, 
And that means looking at the heritage of the minorities, which is often not listed in national heritage inventories. And interlocking culture with humanitarian assistance, not only to get the resources from the humanitarian field, but also to make sure that culture as a sector is accountable. And last, in the most important principle that we must adhere to is do no harm. If we cannot intervene in a responsible way, we should not intervene at all. I know it is difficult, but it is something that we have to consider. And we also have to consider that right now, when the humanitarian response unfolds, culture is not included in the, uh, uh, in the international humanitarian response. And as a result, our responses are ad hoc and donor driven. If Elif Foundation today decides to give funding for X, Y, Z, that's what gets restored. But, and if Alif Foundation is not neutral in its approach, then we have to think about it. I'm not saying that they are not. They are very valued partners of ECROM. But I'm just saying there are very few players and we, our responses are donor-driven and often ad hoc. That's why interagency coordination and joint training of civil protection, military personnel, and heritage professionals is very important, and that's why it is the centerpiece of ECROM training. Scenario-based risk management, it, uh, when we say scenario, we have to think about war scenarios, we have to think about unforeseen alternative scenarios, which, which you know, the black swan events that can happen, that can bring multiple uh, hazards together, and then test our ability and not feel happy that I can manage that small pipe leak in my archive. No. Feel happy when you think you have capacity to deal with a black swan event and you have coordinated. And for this, we need to invest into real understanding of susceptibility and vulnerability. Vulnerability at the staff level, at the human level, vulnerability at the building physical level, and vulnerability in our society, the fissures in our society, which could then be detrimental to safeguarding cultural heritage in times of crisis. It means doing all this to be on the field, together with military and understanding that military is not cheap labor. They're not there to carry out work for you. They are, carry, they are there to manage security, to provide vital services, and you are there working with them, coordinating with them, taking their logistical support, but at the same time, you cultural heritage responders are accountable for your own work. So a cultural first aider is somebody who can plan and implement first aid operations. A cultural first aider is someone who has received prior training. So we are talking about presence, immediate presence. That is what is needed, it is crucial. How many of us have that ability? Ihor Poshiwalo is one such cultural first aider. Erika Hedhamar is one such cultural first aider. And there are many in, I said there are 2,000 plus in the world, and I hope we can multiply further. Now, very quickly, I'll move because I have very little time. I just wanted to bring out two, two aspects here. In this framework that I have been talking about, there is one aspect, which is situation analysis. Now, this is a step that we often just skip. As, as a sector, we don't like to analyze a situation. We say, oh, we don't have any time. We just go and we just rescue those objects, and we are going to be okay. That's an institutional response. That's an ad hoc response. That's, a, that's not an overview response. When we are talking about complex emergencies, 1,000 heritage sites, 400 heritage sites, 750 heritage sites, we are talking about a great number of sites and you are going to provide inclusive, culturally diverse cult aid in order to safeguard the heritage. How are you going to do that? Unless you have the overview. An overview means 
you need a national perspective, you need a regional level perspective, and you need an institutional level perspective to identify the needs and then try to see the risks, multiple risks, and prioritize on three scales, degree of damage, the, the risk involved, and, the, uh, and the, uh, the amount of risk involved, and the, and, the, uh, and the significance of the heritage site. So this three scale criteria is very important, something what we did with NCAM, which is the national uh, authority of Sudan after the war, all of them were in Egypt, and the first thing that needed to be done in that war, nobody could go inside, unlike the Ukraine war, which heritage sites are most at risk of flooding, which heritage sites are most at risk of uh, disasters or uh, 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 of, of the conflict. The, an important tool that we have developed is uh, PATH, which is a peace-building assessment tool. It is a conflict analysis tool. It gives institutions a simple scale of how a particular heritage site might have the conflict risks, and it's free to download. Uh, I don't have time to explain about it. The second step is uh, damage and risk assessment. And again, here I would like to highlight which I have already said, data on loss and damage of cultural heritage is inconsistent, insufficient, and scattered. And this means we have reduced understanding of risk to heritage, limited ability to prevent future damage. To tackle this, ICROM has developed an open source and standardized uh, forms, which are an app, an application, and some forms for intangible heritage, for collections, all types of collections and for immovable heritage. And uh, uh, the app is also multilingual. It can be, it is at the services of our member states. It has been tested in 17 places, especially in Ukraine, where it is helping to calculate the costs for recovery and identify uh, intervention, priorities for intervention. It's something uh, we need to do. It is not conditioned assessment. This is a very big problem with our sector. Uh, we think damage and risk assessment is condition assessment. No, damage and risk assessment is calculation of what is damaged and what is the potential threat. And on that basis, you calculate costs and you identify steps of immediate stabilization. Damage and risk assessment for intangible heritage is a very weak uh, aspect in our sector because here we need socio-economic and political data. We need pre-baseline, uh, you know, pre-event baseline information on how minorities, cultural bearers were living, what were their living conditions, what was their access to health, what was their access to education, what kind of support they had for practicing their crafts or the knowledge that they have or the traditions that they practice and how they have been affected by war or disaster. For example, uh, most cultural bearers in Ukraine uh, that are threatened have been identified to speak Russian language. So, in a black and white, this is the enemy, this is the white person, this is the good person, this is the, you know, the, the enemy. In that atmosphere, how do you uh, generate enough trust to reach out to those who speak the language of the so-called enemy, but may be very vital to nations, peace and security? This is something that you have to think about. And now we are also helping to develop a multi-hazard risk map for cultural heritage of Ukraine, which we hopefully will be able to disclose next uh, uh, month. I will very quickly say these are some of the uh, you know, images that I brought for the next steps, which are security and stabilization, where you have to think about physically stabilizing heritage, finding those places. It's good to know that you already are thinking of evacuation places, storages. But there is also the aspect of memorialization and storytelling and training and working with local communities, engaging local artisans, 
thinking about working with army and for securing intangible heritage, thinking about ensuring safer living and work conditions with access to health services and psychosocial support. Something which, uh, bear, uh, an example that I would like to highlight just in closing is how cultural heritage is important or it was very clear in Japan where uh, a volunteer group engaged older people in recovering uh, the city the archival documents, uh, personal documents, photographs, which were of no use to the heritage departments, but were very precious for the people who had lost everything, <coughs> and these were the remnants. And the uh, psychologist later on uh, went and interviewed these older people who were engaged in this work, and they realized that it helped them to uh, overcome feelings of guilt, survivor's guilt, and also it helped them in overcoming the trauma, the trauma of having lost their relatives in this disaster in Sendai in 2011, which was a very huge disaster. Next is a national team of cultural first aiders supported by the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy in Ukraine. So we are going to help build uh, uh, a first team and we hope, it's our hope that countries have their national teams not in the moment of crisis, but much before that. And to do that, we have uh, received funding from, uh, it's not fully official yet, but uh, we have been working with the Creative Europe program of uh, European Commission. And ICROM is going to uh, work uh, to work with many of the European institutions, cultural institutions, as well as member states to develop uh, readiness within Europe for disasters and conflicts. And we are fully committed to support any Nordic Baltic institution network that comes from this conference and would like to partner with all of you. Thank you for your present attention. Thank you. Oh, oh, please, please, uh, thank you for, it was very rewarding to listen to your presentation. And I must ask you, uh, you were talking about tangible and intangible. What are the main differences uh, between um, performing first aid on uh, tangible cultural heritage, that is material cultural heritage like buildings and archaeological sites, in comparison to intangible cultural heritage, which is... Uh, customs, local customs and traditions, please. So I think the main differences are that uh, there, is, uh, there are many people involved in the intangible heritage protection or safeguarding or its continuation. For example, it's not, I don't feel qualified as a paper conservator, as a risk manager alone to go and approach a community that is traumatized because we are talking about people. Mm -hmm. so, not only anthropologists, but psychologists too. Yeah. Because you never know when you are triggering those memories in people, and they might, you might be you know, uh, responsible for their further, uh, let's say, downfall or deterioration, yeah. because the trauma is there. Yeah. So it's a very, f we are looking at a person. Mm. That's the difference. And uh, also, one, another thing that I think uh, in cultural first aid or our work all around the world from Haiti to Mali to Syria, people are very much connected with their physical heritage also. It's us cultural heritage professionals who see it in a bifurcated way. Yeah. So for people it's not like say my church, this is my mm. intangible heritage, mm. this is oh. my tangible heritage, save this one or save that one. It's all. It's, all. Yeah. Mm. it's, the, it's the experience it's the of yeah. all. Yeah. But what we do is, we create those artificial boundaries and differences. And unfortunately, we are bound by conventions, we are bound by these rules and super specializations within our own sectors that are making us. So the silos is our, not only with the outside world, but also with the 
within the sector. Yeah. So we should have a more holistic view. More holistic yeah. view of yeah, heritage, of yes. And you will also develop this, uh, uh, these issues tomorrow. So we'll uh, hear more from you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.